Hey, welcome or welcome back to the stash. One of the biggest achievements when making and producing comic books is reaching certain milestones. Each one you pass obviously signifies that the book is really popular and loved and stuff like Fantastic Four issue 100 or The Amazing Spider-Man issue 500 are great examples of beloved books reaching incredible numbers while also delivering such a good comic book celebrating it. Now, Spider-Man is one of those special characters who's managed to keep on going for over 60 years, which is incredible for any series, and he's reached a plethora of noteworthy achievements during that time as well. Issue 50 is the iconic Spider-Man No More story, which also introduced one of Marvel's best villains, Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin. Issue 100 had a beautiful cover, although this story was a little bit more... weirder. Peter drinks a serum in hopes of giving up his life as Spidey to be with his love Gwen Stacy, but unfortunately for him, the story ends with him growing six arms, so... That didn't really work out. Issue 200 is simply incredible and an easily one of my favorite Spider-Man comics ever. In this one, Peter confronts the man who killed Uncle Ben, but he's made one big mistake this time again. He's taken Aunt May as hostage. Peter in this was such a fun and captivating read, especially when he's getting uh, really into the fight with the killer. Now for issue 300, Venom. Need I say more? Easily one of the most iconic comic books ever created. Issue 400, it's sad, it's beautiful, it's heartfelt, it's amazing. The death of Aunt May, and honestly, again, one of my favourite comic books ever made. Now for issue 500, I'm sure if you're familiar with my channel, then you know how much I love this comic book. It, it's the perfect ending to the Amazing Spider-Man series, in my opinion. And that was pretty much the end of good Spider-Man comics, especially for the milestone issues. Everything from this point onwards, it's rough. It's pretty rough. Issue 600 marked the marriage of Aunt May and J. Jonah Jameson's dad, as well as the return of Mary Jane after one more day. Issue 700 was the beginning of Superior Spider-Man, and issue 800 was the big battle of Spider-Man and the Red Goblin. And now here we are. The last milestone issue of The Amazing Spider-Man has passed, and technically it's only the sixth issue in the volume, but in total it is issue 900 of the series, which is, again, is a pretty incredible number, but this... This <laughs> Zed Wells does not deserve to write issue 900 of Spider-Man, no way. And just before we take a deep dive into this comic book, I just wanted to thank you all for the recent support on the channel. There's a lot of new faces around, and I just really hope you enjoy your stay at the stash, and we're becoming like one big happy family, and I just, I honestly, I love all of you guys. It, thank you so much. For those of you who are just joining in and like Spidey or just comic content in general, feel free to stick around and maybe hit that subscribe button. Also, one last thing for those who would like to help out the channel and go above and beyond, we do have a channel membership for a small price and you get a bunch of cool little perks. Um, but honestly, this is just, you know, in case you want to go above and beyond and can afford it, no pressure at all. And watching the videos like already is enough, but yeah, just in case. And uh, yeah, time to get back to the video. So our story begins with a flashback and it's around a year ago at Fresh Kills Park, formerly Fresh Kills Landfill, a supervisor is very, very mad that $15 million was spent to empty out a landfill into a public land space. He demands to know why Dr. Petty dug through a landfill and he explains that he was saving the Living Brain Project. When berated for it since the project was terminated, Dr. Petty reveals that he is the project and drops his disguise to gas the ICM staff and the living computer digs up the remains of the living brain with the aim to conclude Dr. Petty's work. As we go to the present day, Peter's friends and family have planned a big surprise party for his birthday, however, since Peter's always late, they had arranged it with him not being on time in mind. But of course, typical Parker luck, am I right? He actually gets the perfectly on time. And now since this is Zeb Wells writing, this Peter just gets yelled at by Nora Winters and is belittled for being early by his standards. It's crazy how we're like now 40 uh, issues in the future and, and nothing at all's changed. Peter just still gets treated like shit by everyone he encounters. We get a little party montage with Peter just interacting with the people there. And Zeb Wells, known for ruining characters, makes no exception here as he completely undoes all of Flash's personal growth and progress by having him act like his high school self again. I mean, this is the first time that Peter has seen Flash since his death way back in like ASM issue 800. And you would think that they would have like a very heartfelt reunion, but they just treat the whole thing as just another throwaway joke. We get another depressing panel um, as we just see Peter questioning if everyone just hates him and Aunt May tries to reassure him, but he reminds her that he ruined his own party by showing up on time. Also, the fact that Mockingbird has more panel time in the landmark ASM issue than Mary Jane Watson just... It just blows my mind. One of the most iconic Spider-Man side characters is non-existent within the big 900th issue landmark. 
Why are you the way that you are? Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not that way. I hate so much about the things that you choose to be. And now senses Peter and nothing goes right in his life anymore, even when it's bad and manages to get worse, J. Jonah Jameson, with the use of Doc Ock's tentacles, crashes the party, however he's clearly not in control of the arms. At least we get one good page featuring Felicia Hardy standing up for Peter since obviously he can't fight back when everyone's watching. You know, like, I sort of forget how good of a character she actually is, but every time she's in a comic book or a show or whatever, she's just always one of the best characters within the story. And I know this is like a little off topic, but I just really hope that they use her for Tom Holland's, you know, new trilogy. It, it's, it's about time we see her in live action. But anyway, the arms take JJJ to the busy streets of New York, and then Spidey is finally able to show up, and the arms quickly latch onto him and write help on the wall, leaving Spider-Man completely confused. As the tentacles lead Spider-Man to Doc Ock, back at the party, the guy who captured Otto also kidnaps Felicia, Robbie, Betty, Aunt May, Anna Marie, and Flash Thompson for the single purpose of pestering them with the one question of, who is Spider-Man? We cut back to a hero to see he finally arrives at the building and is surprised to see the living brain. As he goes to investigate, he gets a small tap on his shoulder and then the big reveal happens. A brand new original character, sorta, I mean, it's just the, the super adaptoid mixed with the Sinister Six, but we're introduced to the Sinister Adaptoid. I mean, the design's pretty cool and I guess overall it is a pretty neat concept, but this is Zeb Wells, so just keep your expectations very, very low. As expected, Spidey just gets his ass handed to him, and even with the help of the tentacles, he's just still no match. Desperate for answers, the mysterious foe is still pestering the gang with the question of Spidey's identity. He even shows him that Spider-Man is no threat to him and, and begins to just explain his origin at the request of Robbie Robertson. He explains his programming and knowledge originated from his creator, Randall Stephen Petty, who continued his father's research and gave inputs resulting in conclusions to his living brain design. With each passing upgrade, the ultra-living brain grew in size until he was housed by a warehouse, yet nobody told or gave him purpose, so he infiltrated an assembly line to fabricate a body and meet his creator. However, Randall Stephen Petty died from information overload and was replaced by the brain. He learned the instinct of legacy as Randall Stephen Petty's father had done the same in creating the first living brain, so emerging with the original, he became the ultra-living brain and came to to take the robot's purpose of learning Spider-Man's secret identity, absorbing all the emotions involved as well, and has been haunted by the question ever since. Thus, he captured Otto Octavius and reactivated the sinister adaptoid to capture Spider-Man. Now, I will admit that, that trying to write that out was very difficult just because of how shit of an origin story it was and how convoluted it was. I even, like, looked at other sources to sort of help me balance it out, but even then, it's just one big mess. Like... Just the line of he died from information overload itself was just enough for me to sort of give up with this one. It'd be funny if it weren't so pathetic. No, what the heck, I'll laugh anyway. <laughs> with the ultra-living brain losing patience, he then moves to just going through Flash's mind to find the answer. However, May and Robbie notice Spidey is slowly regaining his consciousness and try to stall him, and we get this gem of dialogue from... Anna Marie, the woman who was horribly used and taken advantage of by Otto Octavius when he was in control of Peter's body. Just, just keep that in mind. I'm sorry, did you say kidnap Dr. Octopus? Is he okay? Not proud of it, but that man is still my backup. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> having this, having this be Anna Marie's, um, Maria's only contribution to the story is just so stupid and, and it, it's so incredibly pathetic, especially for her character. Like, this severely damages who she is uh, as a person within the, in the Spider-Man mythos. And while there, is pro there probably is, like, some sort of lingering attraction, maybe, they both moved on at the, in, in the superior Spider-Man stories or whatever the hell. And, and to make things worse, I'm pretty sure she even sta uh, previously stated she was basically in love with a shadow and not the real person. Wells wrote not only her incredibly out of character, but also Otto Octavius too. Like, he hasn't acted like such a corny bad guy in decades. Even his past superior self hasn't been this... super villainy. He's been more of an anti-hero, morally grey sort of character um, when he became Superior Octopus, and even during Sinister War, he had moments of not being fully evil, yet here he's just 
full on bad, which makes absolutely no sense, but it's said well, so I guess what do you kind of expect? Anyway, Spidey is finally awake again and does a cool superhero pose because that's all the good things we have left now. Spidey and the Sinister Adaptoid continue their battle, and to be honest, this part is like decent at best, but I mean, it, it could have been way cooler if uh, Zeb Wells properly explored this giant machine that has the powers of the Sinister Six against one Spider-Man. Spidey is still no match and needs help badly, and so he resorts to freeing the real Sinister Six and teaming up with them, creating the Sinister Seven, I guess. I mean, I never thought I'd really see this in my time as a Spidey fan, but it's here. And, and the fight is now clearly much more even, and, and the Seven manage to easily overcome the Sinister Adaptoid and win the battle. However, the war is not over yet, as they find the ultra-living brain's true form. A giant... Well, a giant brain. Who would have guessed? The natural consensus with the group is just for them to kill it, as it's way too dangerous to really let it be. But Spidey being Spidey says that things the thing is technically alive, and we can't kill it. He tries to give this big speech and on why they shouldn't, but the Sinister Six don't really care at all, and I, I sort of relate to them at this point. I mean, after looking through Zebwell's Spider-Man stories for so long, I've sort of lost the will to really care for anything anymore. Naturally, the Sinister Six uh, just go on and bash Spidey, and it's probably their best chance to actually kill him, considering everything that just happened. But something stops Ox uh, Tentacles from dealing the killing blow, and that is because Peter has now bonded with the arms. Uh, and obviously, Zeb Wells continue to explore this, but at the time, I thought it was a pretty decent sort of uh, turn in events, I guess. I wasn't really expecting it, and it's something new in a way uh, for the comics, but it's a bit weird at the same time. We get another cool superhero pose because that's the only thing we really have anymore. And I really appreciate this scene since it's like the only time Zeb Wells has made him any form of being like a hero. Like he's actually heroic in this. The ultra living brain finally gets the answer to his question of who is Spider-Man and it was just staring at him the whole time. Spider-Man is simply a hero. After realizing this, the ultra living brain sends the Sinister Six back to where he found them and Spidey ultimately wins the day and I guess just has to... Well, he unplugs the power source and he beats the ultra-living brain as well. Now, believe it or not, this story finally ends, and it actually ends on a high note? Who would have guessed? Uh, it ends with Peter and Felicia sharing a kiss, and this began the restart of their relationship, which Zeb Wells ultimately ruined later on. You had one job. Just the one. Man, this was rough. I'm really sick and tired of of um, Zeb Wells just ruining all the hard work of other creators with just ignoring all the character development they introduced. And prime examples, in, in this story at least, um, besides Anna Marie and stuff like that, is Mysterio and Doc Ock's redemption arcs just going straight into the bin now. I know it keeps happening, but what's the point anymore? Like, we get invested in these storylines and, and characters just to watch them all stop mattering every time there's a reset. And But it's not even like a full reset, it never is. Um, it's just their history is still there cruelly reminding you of a, a better past and vestiges of better stories lingering about, but this man just has a gift for ruining everything he touches. As someone who's read every Spider-Man comic there is and, and usually loves the milestone issues before One More Day, this is, this is easily the worst landmark issue I've ever read. Like, I don't understand how you mess something like this up, but he managed to and it's, it's incredibly boring, doesn't make sense, very convoluted, it's shocking, the artwork, I can't really, a lot of people seem to really like this artist, but to be honest, I can't stand his work, like, he draws Spider-Man in costume okay, but besides that, I just, it looks too cartoony, um, it, it's, yeah, it doesn't do it for me. I'm not really sure how one, like, massive comic book can have so many problems, um, but this one does, uh, like I said before about the artist and, and the way Zeb Wells just sort of ruins uh, the story of this one, but even just the way, like, I've touched on before, like, characters are so out of character, like, they don't act anything like how they're supposed to, and he just completely ignores all the character development they've been through, and, it, like, Flash just doesn't even, like, when I first read it, I was shocked to see Flash act like how he did in high school, it just made zero sense to me, especially after all him and Peter been through, and, um, you know, like, Anna Marie's weird comment about Doc Ock makes zero sense, and, <laughs> damages her character a lot. Mary Jane's non-existent. In the 900th issue, Mary Jane doesn't even appear once. That is, that is shocking. We had Mockingbird, but not Mary Jane. I don't understand how that works. Betty Brant had like 
one or two speech bubbles, Max, you know, his first, like, proper crush and love interest, and Gwen Stacy's grave wasn't even there, or Uncle Ben, pretty sure, wasn't even mentioned. It it feels like it's not even a Spider-Man story at this point. It's lacking, like, all the crucial aspects of a big milestone issue for this this web-slinger, and it's it's depressing to read. Um, I'm, like, this is still at my local comic book store in the city. Like, this is still there, untouched, not even sold. No one wants this. Like, these books don't sell. I'm not really sure how they're even surviving at this point. But, like, even after that, like, they had the, um, the extra stories as well. And I haven't really properly looked through them. I'm guessing they're not going to be good as well. Um, let me just quickly... Oh, God. Oh, the bonus story is Jimmy Kimmel? Are you serious? Jimmy fucking Kimmel. I'm done. I can't, I can't be bothered. Jimmy Kimmel. I'm done. Screw this shit. Fuck Jimmy Kimmel. Fuck Amazing Spider-Man. Fuck Spider-Man.